Welcome everybody to this week's stop on our great American road trip and welcome to Father's Day week. If you know me, you know I probably, I just couldn't pass up this place this week. 10 miles southwest of Amarillo, Texas, you're gonna find 10 Cadillacs, half buried, nose first, rise from the earth in this not so picturesque cow pasture. And really, you can't make this stuff up. The creation, the, uh, the idea from this place came from a kid's book that somebody found left in a bar. You can't make that up. The creator of this place, by the way, this place was created in 1974. I was four years old, said this, I always love Cadillacs. I want you to stop by here and love this place as well. So the 10 Cadillacs behind me, originally, when they were buried here in 1974, had their snazzy caddy paint jobs, but through the years, the wind and the weather, and mostly vandalism, owned the only thing that's left are the bodies of the Cadillacs. So today, you're encouraged, and a lot of people were actually all blown away how many people have trekked through the mud to bring their can of spray paint and tag with graffiti their very original idea. You're encouraged to come here and make this a unique experience. Somebody said this is an American monument that celebrates life, death, and the luxury Cadillac. So for me, how about that for a spiritual analogy? So welcome to the Great American Road Trip. Welcome to Amarillo, Texas. Welcome to what is known as the Cadillac Ranch. From 2013 to 2017, if you were around, we as a creative team came up with a genius idea. But for the claustrophobic, it can be a nail biter. You guys, yeah, you think I'm crazy. It is going to be an incredibly good summer. And we lock in destinations with spiritual applications. I have never been to a place as cool as this. Keep your eyes peeled. A resident rattlesnake. I'm serious. We've got crazy anomalies going on. Welcome, everybody, to the great American road trip. Hey, while we're clapping real quick, let's give it up. We got a lot of people watching online. This particular service, Teresa in Tennessee, Benton, Tennessee, how are you? Arizona Bill, Keith in Kansas, Megan in Kentucky, the Teeters, what's up in Michigan? How are you? The Smiths in Nevada, Mary in Georgia, Craig and Rosanna in Florida, Carol in Virginia, three families watching in Canada, lots of people all over the place, just to name a few. Everybody give it up for our online family this week. I would love for you to get something to write with. If you want to get your smartphone out, we're going to use that in just a minute as well. That is dicey. I get it. Put it on airplane mode. If not, you're going to be refreshing Facebook or checking your Robinhood account or whatever you're doing. Um, the stock market's closed, by the way. You're like, not crypto. Okay, I get it. Just uh, lock in with me. Let's live in this moment for just a little while. And let's lock in a destination with a spiritual application. If you're visiting with us, this is very different. We're very creative around here. I like it just to get us to engage. That's what we're doing. And in 2013 to 2017, we had this idea of the summer road trip. We all like to break our routines. We, we take a trip. When you come to church, you don't know where we're at. That's kind of awesome. It's refreshing. It's different. And we lock in a destination with a spiritual application. We knew we had one more road trip in us, especially Route 66 from Chicago, Illinois, to Santa Monica, California, 2,450 miles. It was the main street of America in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. 35% of that road is abandoned today. It's an east to west road that a lot of that road has been abandoned due to the interstate system. I like that angle a lot because there's a lot of spiritual application. God is an east to west God. We know that by our key verse, Psalm 103, Verse 12, and it says, as far as the east is from the west, God has removed our transgressions from us. So he wants us to walk in the right direction. I believe God wants us to walk east to west. He wants us to walk toward his grace and his mercy. In 2015, we traveled along Interstate 5, the west coast. I brought my five shirt back out. 
And I talked about that. The idea of West is grace. And the idea of the, the number five was going to symbolize this idea of God's grace, G-R-A-C-E. God gave his only son, Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, that he loves us so much. It's actually God's grace. This East to West idea is mentioned 318 times in Scripture. And what I've equated, if you haven't been with us for three weeks now, we're going to do it all summer, is God wants us to walk East to West. We equate East to the culture. It's easy to walk the path that everybody's walking, but God wants us to turn our backs to the culture and turn our eyes toward Christ and walk westbound. It's easy to go toward the culture, but you will never find what you're looking for. If you're walking in the wrong direction, you will never go to the right destination. The only way to, to walk toward the right destination is walk toward the right direction is to follow Route 66, God's Word, 66 books, His roadmap for our life. It is, a book of, it is a book of love, but it's also a book of sin. That mankind, we have sinned. We have created a blockade between us and God, but yet God loves us so much that he forgives and he forgets. So let's celebrate westward expansion. Let's celebrate God's grace. Let's celebrate this idea. But more than that, walk. Walk toward God's grace. Walk toward God's mercy. And I'm asking that question. You're like, well, Brent, we all do that. No, we don't. I wonder, I, I, I just do. I'll just start by saying this. I don't know why not, everybody's not on this road. I don't know why everybody's not on the road east to west toward God's grace. But just like Route 66, a lot of that road has been abandoned, especially by our society, as we have a godlike complex. So week one, we were in St. Louis, Missouri, if you were around at the Gateway Arch. The Gateway Arch celebrates westward expansion. Last week, we were at the blue hole of Santa Rosa. We were talking about an oasis in the desert. God is our oasis. He can fill us. He is the oasis in the desert, the stream in the wasteland. Who are we looking to? What are we looking to to fill our lives? Who, what, or where is your oasis? God is like, I'll meet you more than halfway, but you got to walk in the right direction. And I wonder where you're at when it comes to that. So this week, Welcome to a weird stop along the summer road trip. Welcome to a place that underwhelmed me when I got there. Have you ever gone to a place that you were so excited to go, you've seen it in pictures, you've heard all about it in pop culture, and you get there and you're like, huh, okay, that's nice. Who's ever been to a place that underwhelmed you? I heard like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I've never been over there, but that's like four feet tall. Apparently that's very underwhelming. This place, if you study Route 66, YouTube it, pull it up, you do what, you're going to see the Cadillac Ranch everywhere. And when you pull up, you're like, huh, why are we all here? Well, we're all here because everyone's walking that direction. So I guess I'll walk through the, peri the uh, parasitic uh, poo and pee in the cow pasture and walk out to see Cadillacs that have been in the ground since 1974. So let's do this. This is interesting. This has been intriguing to me all week. How many of you have ever heard of the Cadillac Ranch? Would you raise your hands high? Look around. That's a lot of people that you're like, literally, it's in Amarillo, Texas, Interstate 40, Route 66. You walk about 100 yards into a cow pasture, and there they've been sitting since 1974. I was four. I'm 51 years old. And you're like, Brent, what's the backstory? There's got to be a good, if you're preaching about it, there's got to be goodness. He, he put those Cadillacs there to save the whales or he did something. Not at all. No backstory. It's kind of not really, there's, not, there's no goodness about this place. A guy named Stanley Marsh III was a Texas billionaire. He got his money earnestly. He, his mama and daddy gave it to him. Any of you got your money that way? Mama, don't raise your hand on that one. He was also in banking. He was married, got divorced, married his second wife. They adopted five kids. I think that is super thoughtful to adopt five kids. But this guy was a weirdo. In 2013, he was accused of sexual assault of minors. But before it went to court, he died in 2014 at 76 years old. But yet you pull up his Wikipedia page he was a billionaire, oil and gas billionaire, a banker. He adopted five kids. He was accused of sexual assault, which would make the news like crazy. But if you pull up his Wikipedia page, what is the first line and what is he known for? 
Wow, what a legacy. He, he said when he started in 1974, he would lie to people when they come out. Here's the whole story, ready? He hired a bunch of hippies from San Francisco called the Ant Farm to come create a roadside attraction that would annoy locals. <laughs> so he bought 10 Cadillacs, 1949 to 1962. He buried them all nose, nose down at, at the same angle of the Great Pyramid of Giza. They're east to west. That's interesting. And when people would come out in 1974, they're like, why are these Cadillacs out there? He would say things like, well, Elvis is fixing to film a movie here. But the greatest lie that he told was this, and I would have bought this lie. He, back in the 70s in particular, he kept saying Evil Knievel was going to jump the 10 Cadillacs. <laughs> Who remembers Evil Knievel? I'm thinking he would do that, wouldn't he? And that's the story. I mean, there's not, you're like, Brent, that's crazy. But there are lessons that we can learn from the Cadillac Ranch. You're like, Brent, you are a weird individual. Number one, it is amazing. Write this down and think about this. At least dwell on it. If you don't want to write it down, don't. That's fine. We'll get to the scripture in a second. Uh, but it is true, right? It's amazing, all of us. It's amazing what stands the test of time, isn't it? It's amazing what sticks in pop culture. It's amazing that almost 50 years later, when we pulled up there, we're thinking, well, this will be easy. First off, there was a huge thunderstorm. I thought a tornado was heading our way any moment. People were getting out of their cars and droves. It was a mud hole. They're out there, look. And as we were getting out, people were putting food city bags over their shoes, tying them around with duct tape, walking out there with spray paint so they could spray paint this. Why do we do that? No one really knows. We're like, well, it's been here forever, so let's do it. And when I was shooting a video, Pastor Mike said, we got to reshoot it because there was a guy spray painting a symbol behind me that didn't say Jesus loves me at that time. It was really nasty. And he's like, Brent, I don't think we can do that. That, but they're like, anything that you spray paint, you better realize it's going to be there for like an hour and then somebody else is going to spray paint something. And people like that, that idea of being able to personalize. So we're going to put 10 Cadillacs out front of the church. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> but it's just a weird story. It's just a weird place. And it's amazing what stands the test of time. But it also, for me as a pastor, it really teaches me this lesson that you can't take anything with you when you die. Everybody look at me. You're going to hate when I say this, but one day we'll all be pushing up Cadillacs. One day we'll all be in the ground. Can you imagine Stanley Marsh III who died in 2014? Do you think this place he thought would have outlived him? No. He did it because he was weird. And that's what people in the 70s did. We're weird. Some of you are like, yeah, that's true. Um, but there was no rhyme or reason he just did it to kind of make a point. This was like a social media influencer before social media. And all these years later, people go out there. It is amazing to me what stands the test of time. And you're like, Brent, I don't get it. Do you realize how embedded this, this weird place out in the middle of nowhere Amarillo, Texas is embedded in pop culture? The song we just sang, the reason we sang it, Bruce, Spring, Bruce Springsteen put it on the uh, River album in 1980, and he wrote that song about that place. In 1985, James Brown, um, living in America. <laughs> you watch that video back when we had music videos? Watch quick, but the Cadillac Ranch will appear right before your eyes. You're like, that is so weird and random. The movie Cars. The Pixar movie Cars, this is Cars at Disneyland. If you watch the movie Cars, there's a mountain formation. That is owed to Cadillac Ranch. It's right in front of our faces and we don't see it. Brooks and Dunn, 2000, their very last music video that they ever produced was where? Honky Tonk Stomp at the Cadillac Ranch. I love Kix Brooks, by the way. I want to be a part of that duo. Ronnie Dunn was the singer. I'm just up there doing that, collecting the check. That'd be great. I mean, it's crazy to think about what stands the test of time, stuff that you can't take with you, and what matters. And that's what I'm after to spiritually, and I need you to listen because it's going to get serious. It's going to get personal. And I just want you to think about a few things because as soon as I thought about the Cadillac Ranch, and of course, I don't think you can take a Route 66 trip, honestly, without stopping here. It is literally top five 
destination stops on Route 66, which is weird. And I was thinking about my life and my papa, my dad's dad, it's Father's Day week, and my papa was a pastor. And when I was a young man in my late teens, early 20s, I would ask my grandfather, who had been in ministry forever, hey, papa, what's like the weirdest thing that's ever happened to you in ministry? Because you've been a part of a lot. Paul Paul was, he pastored in a tumultuous era for sure. He pastored during the, um, the Vietnam era where he, he vividly remembers uh, doing 20, 20 funerals of Vietnam soldiers in a one-month period of time in his community. He physically built eight churches with his hands. And I said, Paul Paul, with all your wisdom, what's the weirdest thing you've ever been a part of? And he would immediately say this, Brent, I did a funeral one time of a lady that loved her Cadillac, uh, really loved her Cadillac. We did the funeral at the church. We went to the cemetery, and I was kind of staggered what happened next. They had gone out with bulldozers. They had dug a huge hole. They had brought a crane out there. They had hooked her Cadillac to the crane. They put her body from the casket into the Cadillac, sat her upright in the driver's seat. They taped her hands to the steering wheel, and he did the committal as they lowered her with her Cadillac into the ground. Paul, Paul, you got me. That's weird. <laughs> Even for us, that's weird. My mom's in the room. I grew up in North Carolina. I was born in Salisbury, North Carolina. My dad pastored in Gold Hill, North Carolina, in the same community as the Earnhardts. Mom would talk and had good friends would talk about Lois and Clark Earnhardt. You're like, I know that last name, Earnhardt. Yes, Clark Earnhardt and his brother, his brother was Dale Earnhardt's daddy, the race car driver. Well, they had money. For, from the tire industry. And so Clark and Lois had more money than they knew what to do with, and Lois liked to drive Cadillacs. And my mom would say that Lois would get a brand new Cadillac, and if something went wrong with it at all, say the blinker fluid, fluid got low, do that, um, she would go get a brand new Cadillac. And my mom would tell you that one time, mom and dad walked out in her backyard and counted 30. Cadillacs just sitting out back. They were pretty much brand new, but anything went wrong. She didn't go get it fixed. She just bought another one. Well, guess what? You can't take stuff with you. When Clark died, they found money underneath rocks around their house. He carried money every, I, I just, I just think that we get so screwed up with our priorities. And I think this place is a shining example of a guy that lived a life. He had a, a good life, um, blessed in so many ways, tragic life, that he, he did wrong, sexual assault charges, awful things, devastating things, but yet what is he known for is something so crazy as this. I wonder what you and I will be known for, known for the days when we push up those Cadillacs. I think sometimes we don't realize things in our life that we might do today will stand the test of time And we don't necessarily want that to stand the test of time. What will we be remembered for? For me, I don't want to be remembered as just a good preacher. Some of you are like, good. (laughs) I mean, I would like for somebody to say that one day, but you know what I want people to say about me? Brent was, he was legit. He was an east to west guy. He was walking in his relationship with God. Was he perfect? Of course not. Did he screw up? Sure he did. That's why God is an east to west God. His mercies are new every morning. Some of you in this room, you're like, well, Brent, you don't know what I've done. I've done it in my life. So what? Yesterday ended last night. God's mercies are new every single morning. What are you doing today into the future? And are you walking east to west? Are you with everybody else in the culture walking toward whatever substitute you've replaced God with? It might even be you. And so what I want to do is I want to take five verses of Scripture. This this week is really different, and I'm really going to try to stand this out. I'm going to do something. Let me find my little card. Hopefully it's right here. Maybe it's not. Yes, it is. I want to give you five things that I personalize in my life, especially for you dads, you men, but this is for everybody. And I want to ask, I want you to ask yourself a question. What am I going to be known for? What do I want to stand the test of time in my life? Five verses of scripture from the Old Testament to the New Testament that I've trying to put into my life. I could give you hundreds, but I'm going to give you five. 
When you leave here, I'm gonna give you this little card. Everybody will get one. I want you to put it somewhere. I want you to memorize these five verses. More than just Bible memory, but which is amazing, I want you to put it, this into your life. I want you to wake up every day, and I want you to think about this. Now, I want you to get your smartphone out. If you have your smartphone, I want you to text the word resolve to 97,000 right now. You're like, this is a weird sermon. Yeah, it's different. Like my mom said, this is weird, but good. Here's what you're going to get when you text that. Text resolve to 97,000, hit send. Tomorrow, you're going to receive a text. And what's it going to be? It's going to be the first verse on this card. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you will receive five text messages only. Monday through Friday, and it's going to be these verses of Scripture. And you're like, well, Brent, why are you doing that? You've given us a card. I'm not dumb. This card can get lost easily. And I want you, I want this to reinforce this moment. And I want you to, I want you to challenge yourself as I'll challenge me. Hey, you know what? What do we want to be known for? What's going to stand the test of time? And I promise you, God's Word does not return void. It's a roadmap to our life. These verses of Scripture I'm going to give you, some of you know these verses, some of you don't. I can give you a lot. I don't want to overwhelm you. I just want to give you five today. And I want you to think about this weird stop. Long after we're pushing up Cadillacs, what are we going to be known for? What's our life going to stand for? What will stand the test of time? Five verses that stand the test of time. First memory verse, Joshua chapter 24, verse 15 in the New Living Translation. I'll set the stage. This is Joshua's final speech to the children of Israel. He was the heir apparent to Moses. He led the children of Israel into the promised land. This is his final moment. It's his opus moment. This is Joshua's final words to impart what he wants to be known for and what's going to stand the test of time. He's going to make this statement. He's going to say this, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the gods, the little Gs of the Amorites, whose land you live in now? And here's the verse I want you to re remember. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Some of you are like, well, that's easy. I don't even know where the Euphrates is, and I don't serve the little gods of the Amorites. Oh, we serve so many little gods today. We put so much in substitution of God. We run to everything but God. We can easily get distracted. And you know what? Instead of walking westbound toward God's grace, we can all find ourselves going with the flow, walking with the culture, mob mentality rules. Why are we walking out in that field in the pee and the poop? I don't know. Everybody else is doing it. We'll go out there too. We'll try to tag something on a Cadillac to say that we were here. We want to be significant. You got to choose who you're going to serve. Jesus will say in the New Testament, get hot or get cold, or I'll spit you out of my mouth. Look at me. If you're the person, and there are a lot of people today, you have one foot into God and one foot in the world, you will be known for that all of your days. You won't make any difference. You'll be known for a mediocre life. And there are tragically lots of people. I have literally done funerals in the last six months, multiple funerals of people that were incredible individuals, but they did not stand for God. They made no statement, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And we came in here, and a lot of people sat through a funeral service really hopeless really sad, really depressed. We put their body in the ground and they'll be forgotten by so many. What will you be known for? What will you stand for? As for me and my family, I pray my son takes the mantle as far as in, in his own personal journey of faith. I believe he's accepted Jesus Christ. My daughter has accepted Jesus Christ. My son-in-law has. But you know what? They will have to choose as well as you will have to choose. All of us in a world that has gone crazy. So many people now walking away from faith. We're not walking the east to west road anymore. So much of it is abandoned. As for me and my family, as much as I can do anything about it, 
we will serve the Lord and we will walk toward the God who created us and who loved us and who redeemed us. Why is not everybody on that road? Second verse of scripture. Just want you to think about. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and you'll get into trouble. Proverbs, the book of wisdom. Do you realize I'm going to ask you this question, and it is a little intense, and it's not as funny necessarily, but boy, it's powerful. Who is speaking godly wisdom into your life? You're like, well, there you go. You're like, Brent, you are. Well, who else is speaking godly wisdom into your life? We equate it this way. If you financially, if you have a friend that they have jacked up their finances, they've declared bankruptcy before, they still are in credit card debt, their, their credit score is negative 340, do you go to them for financial advice? You do not, right? That verse of scripture comes alive. You will get into trouble. Well, just go get it. It's okay. Go, join SoFi. Just say whatever you got to do to finance it. That's God's gift to us. You can become a slave to the lender, right? Um, if you are having marital difficulties, do you go to the coworker who's been married six times? to ask them their advice as to what to do because you're like, well, they have a lot of experience. <laughs> no. Who's speaking godly wisdom in your life? Most people in my life, and I have several that speak into me. They're older than me. They're wiser than me. They've got a lot of life experience. They've walked the road before. They've seen the pitfalls. And boy, do I listen my wife and I look after some of y'all's marriages that you've been married 40, 50 years. We've been married 31 years here next month. You know, we look at you as an inspiration. And, and how does that, how did you make that work so long? Now, there are people that I try to pour wisdom into. I think you have a mentor. You have to have a mentee situation. You have to have people that are pouring godly wisdom into you. And you better be pouring godly wisdom into people. But you can't get those reversed. You got to be careful. And that's a great question to ask. If you're going to walk east to west and you want to stand for something and be known for something, you better walk with the wise. Who's speaking godly wisdom into your life? Third verse, Proverbs 27. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. I love this statement. Guys, if you get nothing out of the message, get this statement. Your family's future depends on how you live today. The greatest influence you can have on your children is to live a right life, to live righteously, is to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Everybody can claim to do that, but are you walking the walk? Who you are when nobody's looking is who you are. What's your family think about you? What do your friends think about you? Your world of influence. Are you the same person that sits in the church pew as you're the same person that sits on your pontoon boat? You're like, well, you just lost me there. People are watching. And long after we're gone, what, what are we going to stand for? Even while we live today, how are we influencing people? Are we trying to take as many people with us on this east to west road and say, listen, walk toward a living relationship with God. God's grace, God's mercy, God's own son, Jesus Christ, loves you so much that he wants you to experience freedom. As far as the east is from the west, God has removed your sin from you. Ephesians 6.4 is a verse I live by. I try to, and I get it wrong a lot. What's it say? Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ. My son actually sat through two services this week. I don't know if his mom made him or he just loves his dad so much he thought it was Father's Day. He needed twice of this sermon. Or he just wanted me to hear that I've screwed up a couple of times with him. And he's like, yeah, and I think it's probably that. But I was very hard on myself growing up, especially when it came to sports. And I'm a very competitive individual. Uh, I was very hard on myself. When I played sports, I was a pitcher. I hit, especially baseball, basketball. And my wife, who was then my girlfriend, would tell you, if I went two for four at a high school baseball game, she didn't want to ride home with me because I was upset that I didn't go four for four. And I pushed that on to my son a little bit through the years, probably quite a bit. And I think I've exasperated him. What does that word mean? Frustrated him, irritated him. 
And a couple of years ago, I had to make a, a life change. I, I chose to turn away from that and turn toward a cheerleader and turn toward like, you know what? So what if you go 0 for 4 today or 4 for 4 today? When it's all said and done, who's going to remember that five years from now? Nobody but you. And I don't want to exasperate him so much when it comes to stuff that don't matter that he will quit listening to me when it comes to spiritual things because dad has irritated him. Mom has frustrated them so much that they're like, I don't want to hear it. And you're like, well, wait a minute. you got to be your kid's best friend. Of course not. My dad, he punished me when I needed to be punished. He was tough on me when I needed to be really, I needed it. But he was my greatest cheerleader. And ultimately, I do believe that's a powerful statement that we have to bring our kids up in training and instruction in the Lord Jesus. First and foremost, where are our priorities? The last verse is a great verse, and everybody will jump on board and say, Brent, love this one. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That sounds a lot like Psalm 103, 12 and Isaiah 43, 25. God is such an east to west God. He loves us. We don't understand how much God wants to forgive us. God is there to forgive. When we take a step toward him, he meets us more than halfway. And a lot of people, though, use this verse of Scripture, and they go, well, good, I'll do whatever I want to do, and I'll just throw that card out, that verse out every day, and I can go wheels off buck naked crazy. But true confession is, really involves what? It's not continuing to sin. It's not like, well, God, I know I need to be walking toward you, but I'm, I know, I know, I'm walking, I'm just walking further away. It's like, you know what? Enough is enough. I don't want to walk that way. I want to walk toward you. I understand the freedom that I have when I walk toward you. And people ask me all the time, and I like this, if God's forgiveness for our sins through Jesus Christ has already forgiven us, why 1 John 1, 9? Why do we confess our sin? And this is what I'll say to that. Three things. Number one, agreeing with God that our sin is truly sin and that we want to turn away from that, that idea of blocking that relationship and fellowship with God and the stuff that so easily can chain us. We want to walk toward that living relationship. We agree with God, hey, you know what? What I'm doing is not a mistake, it's not a hiccup, it's wrong, and it's not according to your will, to your word. I'm not walking in the right direction. Why do you think I would ever walk toward that right destination? Two, ensuring that we don't conceal our sins from God, which we can't do, but we try to do that with ourselves. We try to think, well, we, we, we justify our society is that way today. What used to be very wrong is now okay because we all just walk that road. We don't know why we're there, but we're all there. Three, we recognize our tendency to sin and we rely on God's power to overcome it. I, I pray this every single day because I know this, right? If I morally fail as, as your pastor, I allow the enemy to tempt me and I go down that path and I morally fail. I get that the collateral damage is going to be awful in our church, in our community, and for my family. And I'm not dumb enough to think, you know what, well, I, I never will. Hey, God, I need your power to overcome it. I put checks and balances in my life and I, I, I ask for godly counsel. And I do that every single day and ultimately don't look for wings and halos because I screw up more than I'm probably good when it comes to especially defeat in my mind, discourage it in, in my mind, just God, can, you, can we really see this happen? Can I really make a difference with my family? Can I really do this? And ultimately, I have to rely on God's power to overcome it. Five verses of scripture that honestly, if you take this beyond a sermon and you're like, Brent, I put this into my life, in my heart, in my mind, what a difference. What do you want to be known for? What do you want to stand the test of time? I'll close with two stories. One will get me in a little trouble. The other one's awesome. <laughs> There's a man who uh, had the uh, rare opportunity to read his obituary. Wasn't a mistake. He opened up the morning newspaper years ago, flipping through the paper. He got to the obituary section and pulled up his name. It was him, and it was his life. And he's like, I don't think I died. It was obviously a mistake. They thought he had died and they had put his name in the newspaper that he had passed away. And he was staggered at the last statement. 
He said, this man will ever be, forever be known for the man who created dynamite. It staggered him, he said. He goes, I can't believe that my life, that's what people are going to read about me. That's what's going to stand up. That I created dynamite, this, this weapon of mass destruction, this entity that can destroy things. Do I really want to be known for that? And so he had a chance, because he's alive, to change it, and he did. He said, it shook me to the core, and I began to change the trajectory of my life. I want you to meet a guy. You don't know him personally. He didn't live when we lived, but you know him. His name is Alfred Nobel. He's the originator, the inventor of the Nobel Peace Prize. You know him because of that. That's what has stood the test of time with his name. How many people have ever heard of the Nobel Peace Prize? Did anybody ever know that Alfred Nobel created dynamite as well? You're like, really? He did. It's amazing what you can do, especially with God, the power to change your trajectory in life, the direction, and it's all thanks to Route 66, God's Word. It's amazing how we've screwed up our priorities. Last story, a couple weeks ago, I was at the gym. I go to the gym two mornings a week and a couple days a week during the lunch. You're like, Brenda, it doesn't show, but I go four days a week. Two days a week, I go at 6 a.m. and then 5 a.m. I'm at the gym at 5 a.m. My friend Josh is like, you better go. He always kind of checks my man. He's like, I'm checking your man card. If you're not going to be there, show up. And he pushes me and then he misses church and then I hammer him hard on that one. We were there a couple weeks ago. It was 5 a.m. This guy was lifting weights next to us and he was sculpted. I mean, it's kind of a guy that you're like, Lord have mercy. This guy is ripped. Started talking to him. He goes, yeah, I come to the gym here five, six days a week at 5 a.m. I'm like, he goes, I do leg day twice a week. Wow. I do leg day once a month. I can't sit on the toilet for seven days. <laughs> Y'all know, right? And then it gets better. Check this out, y'all. He's like, well, I also, I get up at 3 a.m. and I run a 5K six days a week before I come to the gym at 5 a.m. And I'm like, no wonder you look like Aquaman. I mean, it's incredible. And then he said this, we got talked for just a second. He goes, well, you know, it's all about my ticker. And I'm like, well, do you have a heart issue? He's like, no, I want to keep my ticker healthy. I'm like, thinking to myself, I have never known a more disciplined person in my life. And then the train came off the tracks. He goes, you know, I love my cigarettes and beer. He goes, yeah, I, I, I work out. So on the weekends, I can go kind of wheels all bug naked crazy. Because I typically am so hungover on Saturdays, I just, you know, sleep in all day Sunday. And I'm thinking, I don't think I've ever met somebody so disciplined and missed the point so much. Have you? I mean, it's like, the, and it, but you know what? I, he's not alone. There's so many people like that. We're like, oh, I've got to work on my body. That's great. But you realize you are earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. You're going to be pushing up Cadillacs you do remember, right? You're a spiritual being in a physical body. That your heart and your soul, who you are as an individual, will last on for eternity. That life force behind this shell is really what people will remember. What do you want to be known for? That you messed up your priorities your entire life? No. Be known for a man, a woman that stood their ground in faith and said, as for me and my family, we'll serve the Lord. As for me and my family, we're going to wake up every day. We're not perfect. That's why we serve an east to west God who forgives and forgets. But we're going to walk toward him more today than today and more tomorrow than today. And just say, God, in my life, be glorified. What if we wake up every single day, all of us, and go, God, in my life, in my home, in my parenthood, in my work habits, in my co-working world, in my world of influence, what I'm doing here and there and everywhere. God, you be glorified in my life. Less of me and more of you. What do you think will happen? You will change so much of what you're going to be known for. Things that stand the test of time. I'm your pastor. I just want you to know that, hey, I'm trying, I'm trying to walk that east to west road and I want you on that road with me. 
I do. It's the road. Even though the culture has abandoned the road, it's the way that leads to life.